So I am indeed Cheryl Fossil. I do work for Tangent Energy Solutions. Uh, our company specializes in distributed energy resource management, or DERM, uh, which is the new buzzword. Uh, I did come to Tangent as a graduate of this program. I gave uh, my presentation on energy storage selection criteria, and my boss was sitting in the audience and hired me a, a few months after that. So uh, you never know where this program might take you, and right now it's brought me back to Lehigh to talk to you about the energy storage challenge. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is why are we even having this conversation? And there are a number of factors that are contributing to the growth of energy storage. Uh, if we go from the kind of top down, federal legislation is a driving factor. Uh, there is a, a bill being considered, actually started in 2015, it's now carried over 2016, uh, and it does have a section regarding grid storage technologies. Uh, right now that was in committee. Uh, no one's really sure if anything's going to happen with it, uh, obviously with the election coming. But the fact that there is federal legislation that includes grid storage is a huge move forward for the industry. Uh, and in case you weren't aware, there's this thing called the Clean Power Plan, uh, which is actually being heard today, uh, which doesn't necessarily have provisions for energy storage, but as part of its drive, a lot of individuals believe that energy storage is going to be necessary for the states to meet their Clean Power Plan uh, initiatives or goals. There's also state mandates. Uh, there's two major ones and then a third one coming. One is in California with their uh, distribution resource plan. And then we also have New York Rev, which is reforming the energy vision. Both of those stipulate energy storage at some type of level, be that behind the meter customer or at the grid level, which would be with the transmission owners. And we also have Massachusetts, uh, which is in the process of formulating just how much energy storage they want their transmission utilities to own. And there's also these things called renewable portfolio standards. 29 states have them. It doesn't necessarily mean they're all the same, but it does mean that they are encouraging renewable energy development, and what also comes together with renewables is firming them or making sure that they don't disrupt the grid. And many, many folks believe the best way to firm up renewables is to use energy storage. We also have changing rate structures and, again, the push for renewables. Uh, I'll get in a little bit more about rate structures a bit later. Uh, microgrid development. Uh, a number of regions of the country are very much pushing for microgrids, particularly areas that have been devastated by storms uh, and have some serious issues in reliability. And as microgrid development continues, many microgrids have a renewable energy component. As I just said, you have renewables on the system. Uh, they tend to go hand in hand with storage now. And there's also the concept of environmental stewardship. Um, when I was here, I did do a project looking at the uh, environmental flair associated with energy storage. And if any of you are familiar with the chemistry, you're not necessarily talking about environmentally friendly materials, but compared to some of our fossil fuel combustion plants, uh, energy storage does have a leg up, particularly if we get into recycling those materials. So some folks believe that energy storage is actually a more environmentally sound solution to some of our transmission and distribution issues. So we can look at energy storage worldwide, uh, and we see that the majority is third-party owned or utility owned, uh, largely because customer owned tends to be a bit smaller, so we'd expect the distribution to be smaller. Uh, in that proliferation, we see 193 gigawatts of storage, which makes me really excited, until you realize that all but 10 of it is pumped hydro. So the majority of energy storage that exists today is pumped hydro. Uh, again, you can look at the numbers, pumped hydro storage is obviously much larger facilities, uh, many more megawatts uh, to call from, but uh, it's a bit disconcerting that this number has actually only increased by about one gigawatt in the past year, and of that, we're seeing the utility portion increase. So those are the trends, some of the trends that we're seeing. So we're having this conversation about energy storage. Why should we view it as an asset? Uh, energy storage comes in unique flavors, which we'll talk about soon. One of which is that it can provide many different functions at many different levels. Uh, Sandia National Laboratories actually examined this and said, we think there's about 15 different ways energy storage can be utilized. And that goes from the customer level up to uh, the grid level. Those are listed down here for your interest. Uh, we also know that energy storage has the ability to enhance your pre-existing assets and also to kind of improve the assets you don't even have yet. And what I mean by that is we can look at energy storage as coming into play to firm up renewables that already exist. We can also look at energy storage at a substation level to maintain reliability of that substation. So any type of upgrades that you do to that substation, you've got storage there already to enhance those future assets. 
And storage has the amazing ability to scale. Just because you installed a certain capacity today doesn't mean you have to keep that capacity forever. Some are better at that than others. Obviously, changing the scale of pumped hydro is a bit difficult, uh, but some of your smaller storage systems are easily scalable into larger systems. So the storage types, uh, we get into two different realms. Uh, we've got your electrochemical storage and your non-electrochemical storage. Folks tend to be more familiar with the non-electrochemical side. So we'll begin with the superconducting magnetic energy storage. Uh, this is where you create a magnetic field using superconductors and kind of contain the energy in that field until you need it. As you can imagine, you're using superconductors, so this requires a lot of energy to keep those things cold. Uh, so this is a very rapid release, rapid restore type of technology. Compressed air energy storage is, in essence, just what it sounds like. You take advantage of, say, a cavernous feature. You force air into that cavern under high pressure. Then you release it uh, so that it can be used to eventually uh, turn a generator. Pumped hydro, taking advantage of a displacement of water. Uh, so you're pumping the water up when electricity prices are low. You're allowing it to flow when electricity prices are high so that you can sell that back to the grid. Flywheels, storing energy and rotational energy, either increasing or decreasing the rotation. And thermal comes in two flavors. Uh, you can do uh, thermal that is based on heat, in which case you're heating a substance to uh, a molten state most likely, and then using that as your heat sink, or you go in the other direction where you're using ice storage that could interact with, say, a cooling system uh, for an HVAC. And then on the electrochemical side, which is where I tend to drift uh, because of my background, you've got batteries, which we'll spend a little bit of time on. I list fuel cells because they are electrochemical, but technically a fuel cell is simply an energy conversion device. It is not an energy storage device. And then lastly, supercapacitors, which are just amazing. Uh, they have the ability uh, to hold a massive amount of charge and release it very quickly. Uh, but when you talk about that, you're not talking about long-term storage or large storage. Um, they're very good for power quality, but not necessarily some of the uh, applications that uh, my company So just to give you some examples of some storage facilities, uh, obviously all over the world as you saw in the map before. But one of the things I do want to talk about, when you talk about energy storage, it's not just about the storage device. You have to look at all the other supporting components. Uh, you have to look at the fact that you've got to have some kind of control system, particularly for your electrochemical storage. Um, you also need to have your power conversion system, and then anything else in balance of plant, transformers and wires and so on and so forth. Some systems obviously require a few more safety features than others, so that comes into the cost as well. So there are a number of factors to consider when we look at the different types of energy storage. When we look at those types of energy storage and then overlap that with Sandia's 15 different applications, we get something that looks like this, where we can see where does storage fit in terms of its capacity. As you can imagine, pumped hydro has a massive capacity uh, as we would expect. Uh, we've got our SMES and our high power capacitor, which are moving a little bit farther down the line. What I'm interested in is the fact that batteries span such a large portion of this capacity. And that means they have attributes that can do a number of different applications. And the more applications, the more money we can make. So to segue to batteries for a second, because I'm not sure how familiar you might be with them, uh, they are controlled electrochemistry. We take advantage of the fact that there are uh, some elements out there that are more than happy to donate their electrons and it makes them more stable. So we typically have some solid electrodes, uh, which is where we're going to have our conversions. Uh, the other reactants are stored internally, and that energy conversion takes place at the electrodes. There are many variations on this, particularly not having the electrochemical electrochemistry take place at the electrode, uh, which is going to be helpful for degradation. There's different flavors of what those electrodes can be. Uh, there's other flavors of are you going to coat them with special materials to improve reaction rates or transfers. So all sorts of stuff going on here. These reactions are reversible, hence rechargeable batteries. Uh, typically to get the reaction go in the opposite direction, you need to supply energy. We would call that charging of the energy system. And in case you wondered, why should you care? These are the attributes that are going to dictate how long your, your battery storage is going to last. We know that if you've got chemistry taking place at a site, that site is prone to degradation or corrosion. We know that if you're going to increase uh, anything in that system, you're going to have to add more reactants or change those reactants. And so that dictates the properties of your batteries. 
And unfortunately, in the solid state batteries, your lithium ions, your lead acids, it's very difficult to scale those up larger because you start getting into the electronics, which is where you're going to increase those resistances, and that defeats the purpose. So all of this chemistry actually comes into play when we talk about which storage system we want to use. So the other types besides your lithium ions and lead acids, which folks know about, are the aqueous flow batteries, a tiny little image at the top. These guys have the tanks on the side, electrodes in the center, so you're only pumping in the reactants when you're going to utilize the system. And typically, those reactants are replenishable and scalable, so that's the difference between them and uh, your solid state batteries. There's also an upcoming technology called metal air batteries. I love it, it's metal and air. You're getting simpler there. Uh, in that case, you're using a reactant near typically oxygen. Air flows through uh, the system. One of the byproducts is another gas, usually hydrogen, uh, and you generate uh, your circuit that way. Uh, one of the differences between the metal air batteries is you typically only have one electrode, one solid piece of, of chemistry. And again, that helps in terms of degradation. But either way, no matter what storage device we look at, we have to look at the reactants because they're going to dictate those properties. Energy density and power density, those are the two big ones. So your energy density, how many kilowatt hours are you getting, and your power density is how many kilowatts can be pushed. So then why is lithium ion winning? Uh, if you look at the stat at the bottom, of those 10 gigawatts of non-pumped hydro storage, about 70% of that is lithium ion chemistry. So clearly lithium ion has something that the others do not. One, it was already in the market. Um, we look at your phones, your computers, and so forth. Lithium-ion batteries were already present. It was quite easy to scale those up. But number two, when you look at the other solid-state chemistries, like your lead acids and your nickel metal hydrides, lithium-ion beats them hands down in terms of its density and its, its power and energy output. It is just that good. As we know, that sometimes comes with some other issues like So looking at the different battery types, uh, we've got uh, your up well, and other storage types. You've got your pumped hydro and your compressor energy storage. There are a number of pumped hydro facilities. The oldest are in Germany and Switzerland. They're running about 60 years old now. They're still working. Uh, compressed air, there are two facilities, uh, one of which has been shut down. Uh, flow batteries, uh, you'll recognize them by their lingo. They're sometimes called redox. Uh, VRV, PSB, it's really just talking about what elements are inside them. Vanadium, uh, sometimes you're looking at sodium, lithium, and so on. Uh, advanced lead, your uh, sodium nickel chloride batteries, lithium ion, lead acids, and so on, pretty familiar. Ones that are not necessarily common here are the sodium sulfurs, and what are called the zebra batteries. Uh, they run at about 300 degrees Celsius. Um, they're very common in Japan, uh, but we really haven't taken advantage of that technology here. But as you can see, like I said, battery storage encompasses a very large capacity, and that means it can do a number of functions. So another thing we need to talk about are cycles and efficiency. Cycles particularly when it comes to batteries, but efficiency for any storage type. Uh, cycles is your round trip, your charge and discharge cycle. Most of these uh, are based on the lifetimes of the batteries. So there, there's a give and take there with the chemistry and also what's going on in terms of where you're, you're, how fast you're pushing that battery to function. But at any rate, uh, you do want to look at your typical life cycle for a, bat for a battery storage system is about 15 to 20 years. And like I said, for pumped hydro, it's about 60. Uh, batteries also behave differently depending on how you, you push them. So for example, it depends on how old they are, what's going on at the electrode, what's going on with the reactants, um, what function are they serving? Are you rapidly discharging and charging them? Or are you only using them once a day? Uh, and that all gets wrapped into this measurement called efficiency, which is kind of an anomalous, but it, it, it tries to put all this together to say, how does this storage unit compare to another? As you can imagine, pumped hydro and compressed air storage have a very high efficiency. They run about 80%. Uh, depending on which battery manufacturer you ask, they'll tell you a different range of percentages. Uh, their competitors might tell you a different range. Uh, so it's very difficult, partly because none of these systems have been around for a long period of time. So no one's really sure what their overall efficiency is. So clearly, 
as you picked up on, there are areas for improvement with all of these technologies. And one of the problems you face is how long do you wait for them to improve? Do you install now or do you wait for the next generation of looking ion batteries? Yeah. Uh, what we see is uh, looking at how can we change the properties of the battery, for example. What other elements can we use? What other chemistry can we do? Uh, making sure that that chemistry is happening where we want it to happen. Um, lots of talk. Uh, about nanotubules in storage right now because we can just direct those electrons wherever we wish them to go. Um, huge topic. We used to be graphene, now it's changed to nanotubules. Um, hybridizing, and this is in two different ways. It would make sense if we have one storage device that's very good at, say, peak shaving, and we have another storage device that's very good at frequency regulation. Why can't we pair them together? Why can't we have a system that has both storage types so that we can do both those applications? We also have uh, using different technologies in general, looking at a pumped hydro facility and installing a metal air battery in that same facility, again, to complement each other. We also have a huge push in material science for environmentally benign materials. Uh, we're very fortunate in terms of lead acid chemistry in that we recycle about 80% of the lead that's found in batteries, which is fantastic. I cannot say the same for lithium. So there is a push to use things that are much more available, like your iron, um, or using things that aren't quite as volatile. Um, so for example, looking at magnesium and so forth. And also using materials that folks are familiar with. If I talk about organometallic batteries, not a lot of folks understand what that is. And as soon as they don't understand, they've immediately shut off to even considering it as an option. Uh, so there's lots of chemistry going on there in terms of material science. And then also looking at least impact solutions. And what I mean by that is taking advantage of infrastructure that's already present. We have a number of mining facilities that have been abandoned that could easily be configured, which is easily, but could be configured for compressed air energy storage. Uh, we have a number of sites that are already dammed that could be used as pumped hydro. Uh, and we also have run of river systems and tidal systems. Uh, one of the first tidal systems is, is just in operation, which is fantastic. And then also, we have a number of PV sites and wind sites that have already been installed from the last round of the ITC credit. So why don't we pair those with storage? We've got the space, we've already got the infrastructure, so let's use it. So lots of folks who are actually going after these types of situations and lots of areas for individuals from different fields to contribute to energy storage and obviously ultimately grid stability. So while I was here at Lehigh, um, for my master's in engineering, I looked at how do you figure out which storage type you should use based on your set of criteria. Uh, and obviously, those criteria can change. Some folks would hone in on cost. Uh, some would look at um, the characteristics. I don't want anything that's going to catch on fire. Uh, some folks are going to look at the application level. What are we going to use this thing for? And ultimately, you could go through some iterations, and it would easily tell you which storage system you should install. Somebody smile. Thank you. Um, there is no easy way to determine which stores. Some make sense, obviously. If you don't have a cavern, you're not probably doing compressed air. I get that. But let's say you want to do peak shaping. Which system should you choose? You could choose any of them. They all look some better than others. Let's say you want to do peak shaving, but you also want to look at how the components might degrade over time. That's going to limit you in some cases, but it still opens up five or six choices. So it becomes very difficult for entities to determine which energy storage asset they should choose. Of course, every manufacturer will tell you theirs is the best, but how do you make that decision? You're talking about, in some cases, a multi-million dollar asset. You can't go with your gut. You have to have a series of decisions that have been made logically and with financial considerations in mind, and it's not easy. Compare that to, I need peak shaving, I can put in uh, a gas-fired peaking unit that I know is going to be available, I know I've got the fuel supply, I'm going to stick it right here and I'm done. So one of the things you run into with energy storage is there are still other solutions out there that are easier than trying to go through this iterative process. So one of the things um, my company focuses on is determining the value of storage. Uh, and you can do this with any asset. We could look at a gas fire generator. Uh, we can look at demand response as an asset. Uh, 
But you're going to go through these particular um, iterations, one of course being locational, and that means do you have something that needs support, like a renewable system? Do you have uh, a distribution system that is prone to failure in a certain area? Uh, do you have a transmission area that's prone to uh, superstorms or, or whatnot? So providing that, that infrastructure support via location. We also can look at what's going on in terms of planning. So we have a lot of what are called non-wires alternatives right now. What that means is a lot of transmission companies have been charged with, you've always done this solution for this problem. You've never thought outside of that solution. Let's start looking at alternatives. And what I mean by that is, you could look at, we are experiencing higher peak load. We have to build a generator to meet that load. No, you could do demand response to meet that load. We could install a storage system to meet that load. We could look at shifting that load uh, to another substation, another area if possible. So those non-wireless alternatives are really pushing forward energy storage and are allowing it to come into the market as an equal player to those other solutions that have existed for a long period. We also need to look at technology, like I talked about. Different chemistries cost different amounts of money. Uh, clearly, building a pumped hydro facility from scratch is a massive undertaking. It's going to take you decades to get it finished between the permitting and the actual build. You may not ever get it to be built. Same way with new transmission lines. Uh, that can be a horrendous process to try to build a new transmission line. So when we talk about that technology, we look at what's going on with lead acid, lithium ion, flow batteries, new technologies. Uh, technologies that have been around a while, like lithium ion and lead acid, tend to be cheaper in cost. But the newer technologies that are coming out are using materials that are readily available and chemistry that's pretty simple. That lowers their cost automatically. So lots of factors to take in with the technology. In some cases, uh, folks look to energy storage as a portfolio requirement. That could be because of a mandate. It could be because they just want to add it in uh, as an additional resource uh, based on their local peaking patterns and whatnot. So we could be looking at monetizing that asset simply because it's, it's been required to be there. <coughs> resiliency. If anybody can put a dollar value on resiliency, please email it to me. Because it is insanely important and ridiculously difficult to monetize. Um, what is the value of folks on the East Coast not being without power in fall when a crazy October snowstorm comes and knocks everything out for a week? What's the value to that? Is it like the groceries that were lost in the refrigerator? Is it the folks that couldn't get to work? Is it the hospital that got flooded as folks needed emergency shelter? What is the value of that? It's ridiculously hard. Uh, to compete. Some folks are trying, uh, but we still haven't seen a really good way to say this storage device is going to save you X because when the grid goes down, it will be there. And we also have the reduction of greenhouse gases. There are a number of uh, think tanks that are looking at uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Clearly, we do still have greenhouse gas emissions when a storage device is being, is being created, particularly uh, battery storage. But overall, once that asset uh, is deployed, greenhouse gas emissions are zero at that point. Uh, and that can be a, a very significant factor, uh, particularly if you're trying to install something that's going to do peak shaving in, say, Philadelphia. You won't install a generator in Philadelphia uh, for large-scale peak shaving because the emissions structures will not let you do it. Local municipalities sometimes have emission standards that will uh, completely prevent you from putting in certain types of assets. So something to consider. And if we try to put a value on that as well, uh, REV, had, New York REV, the Reforming Energy Division, has actually tried to combine uh, not only the pollution issue but also greenhouse gases into their societal benefits cost. And so when you monetize an asset in New York, you actually have the ability to say, this is how New York values this asset in terms of how society is benefiting, be that gas is pushing and so forth. So they're trying uh, to bring some dollar values to that, but it's still very difficult. An emotional appeal. This is kind of a new one. An article um, was just presented via, via GTM research, and, and Navigant kind of came up with the same idea. When it comes to residential storage, it's really not a good option. It really doesn't make sense. Partly because the scale is so small, which makes it more expensive. The infrastructure you've got to put in place is expensive. 
It really doesn't make sense. But everybody went bananas when the power wall came out. Why, why is that? Because it has emotional appeal. Right? The emotional appeal of I am independent of the grid. That power goes out, I'm still going to have my orange juice. It's going to be cold. Right? Same idea of a backup generator, but storage is so much more expensive at the residential level than a backup generator, yet folks ran out and got power wall systems. That emotional appeal. So let's look at then, how are these costs trending? And this is an amazing, amazing time for energy storage. So this particular graph was generated at the end of 2013. And we can see the various different storage types. Uh, I'm actually gonna work from the right to the left on this. So if we look at the browns, we are looking at the zebra and sodium sulfurs. Those are those high temperature battery systems, the 300 degrees Celsius. And if you look over time, their costs aren't projected to change very much. And that's because this is very, I should say very old, this is older technology, that there's, there's really not a whole lot of ways to improve upon it. Maybe someone will have a breakthrough, I'm not really sure, but those costs are pretty well known and pretty consistent. Uh, think of that uh, in terms of when we build any other type of generation asset. Those costs are pretty fixed, pretty well known. If we look at then the grouping here, I just want to focus on the blue and the yellow. Uh, those are your small format lithium ions as well as your lead acids. We can even go one further to large formats. Large and small format just means how big is the cell that you're working with. Small format is small. Large format is large. The difference being when you've got a chemistry failure in the middle of a large format, you can't really do much about it when you've got to replace it completely. A smaller format can be isolated. That cell can be isolated from the system depending on the degree of technology. So again, lead acids, lithium ion formats have been around a very long time, so we don't anticipate their costs changing very much. Uh, but the one big anomaly there would be in the large formats, because folks are getting better at isolating those large formats and being able to deal with the chemistry problems on the inside. Um, but what that'll do is just bring them on par with the small formats. So, okay, makes sense. When you look at the flow battery, it's an amazing, amazing series of events. Um, when I posted this, we were looking at flow battery chemistry being one of the more expensive, uh, partly because it does have so much stuff that comes along with it. It's got tanks, it's got pumps, it's got all that infrastructure to deliver the fluid into the cell. Then it's got all the components inside the cell, so there's a lot going on there. But what's happening is we're seeing flow battery costs decrease at a frighteningly fast pace. And so where we are now is what we call the 2020 breakthrough. Everything indicates by 2020 that your flow batteries will be on cost with your lead acids and your lithium ions. And that's a game changer because the lithium ion costs aren't going to change that much afterwards. Not, not much more you can do. And that means all those lithium ion folks out there now have competition that wasn't there before. Um, and we've seen a lot more flow batteries being installed in the past two years than previously, so we, this tide is coming. There's also the 2020 potential in terms of all those balance of system costs. We talk about the safety features, um, all the other components, the power conversion systems, uh, the electronics to actually control the battery. All that stuff is improving. Uh, storage gets to ride on the back of solar. Um, solar has greatly improved inverters for us, and they're only getting better. Storage just rides right on its tails. Uh, and of course, the electronics obviously improves at a fast rate. So we expect that we're going to see your storage technologies um, that are the main players to be all on par cost-wise by the year 2020. Trends in growth, uh, we were projected uh, for 2015 to install about 200 megawatts of energy storage. We hit about 220, so projections there held. 2016 is looking to be uh, right on par um, in between five and six, depending on which projects actually, and 500 and 600, depending on which projects finished. Uh, what we're also seeing though, by 2020, we were projected to have one gigawatt of energy storage. That's now been pushed to 1.5 gigawatts. And of that, the utility storage portion is up by about 5%. So of the battery store of the energy storage that will be out there, over 50% will be utility owned. And that becomes very important in terms of monetizing that asset. There are areas of the country where utilities are not allowed to own storage. It's considered generation. They can't own generation. There are areas of the country where storage is considered demand response. Utilities aren't allowed to do that either. 
There are areas of the country where storage isn't classified at all. So nobody knows what to do with it. Nobody knows how to monetize it. There are areas of the country where small-scale storage has a classification, large-scale storage has a classification, and anything in the middle cannot participate in anything. So again, when we talk about expected trends, one of the things that's going to fall suit is what are the areas of the country going to do with storage as an asset? Because um, a lot of RTOs and ISOs are really struggling with this idea. So other barriers and, barriers and obstacles to adoption would be, when we talk about an asset like a large scale gas generator, um, so, so 100 megawatts, um, there are numerous amounts of material to help you build that asset, to help you know how to build that asset, what you have to go through to build that asset, the permitting that's required, the space that's required, all the infrastructure and so on and so forth. Um, I can think of it as, as Babcock and Wilcox, the, the, the volume that's this big that talks to you about different types of generation. Uh, for energy storage, there, there isn't a book. There, there isn't a manual that you pick up and say, this is how you install your energy storage. Uh, so there is an alliance, uh, the Modular Energy Storage Standards Alliance, that is trying to come up with standards so that when an entity like a utility, if they can, wants to own that asset, they have a textbook, so to speak, of how do you start this project? What do you do? What do you need? Uh, what are you going to look at in terms of costs? One of the other issues that is coming into play, particularly in California, uh, it's very easy to talk about energy storage in terms of capacity, 10 megawatts, 1 megawatt, so on and so forth. Um, but one of the other features that energy storage has is its ability to ramp up and down very quickly. And that becomes an important asset, particularly for renewables, and if you want to do anything in a frequency response situation. So there currently, on this side of the coast, isn't the ability to monetize an asset based on its ramping ability. But in California, they have actual monetization techniques for the ability of your asset to provide that ramping control. So in some cases, where you're installing your asset, it isn't necessarily about its capacity. It is about its ability to stabilize the grid. Depends on location. Perception. This one really irritates me. So the Department of Energy, which I hold very dear because they paid for my degree here, uh, published in 2015, uh, the future arrives for five clean energy technologies. I'm very excited um, because I perceive that energy storage is a clean technology. You can throw some of them out if you think they're too environmentally risky, but there are certainly some in there that are wonderful technologies. And aside from EV batteries, not a one of them was listed. Not one. This was the Department of Energy. Rate design classification of market structures. We could spend all day talking about this. There are some specific issues with rate design uh, that, we're, that we're seeing, part in part, because we've got so much solar in some places that the utilities are looking at ways to, in essence, get their revenue back, and so they've stopped net metering policies. Uh, so folks are obviously, well, then I'm going to install a battery. I'm not going to get the money out of my PV system that I thought I would. I'm going to use energy storage, so at least I can take that excess energy that I'm not being paid for and put it in my battery, which is wonderful. Um, you also have time of use rates coming into play, where you are paying more uh, when it is costing more to service your needs for electricity. We have demand charges that are coming into play. Um, demand charges are a bit harder to chase. They're a bit harder to manage. Um, storage is a great asset for that, um, but again, a little bit more difficult. And the market structure, I'm very fortunate in that PJM does have a space for energy storage. Um, it does, in essence, treat it like a renewable asset. Uh, we've got ISO New England, uh, which is struggling with energy storage. ERCOT is the one I talked about. If it's big or small, you're fine. If it's in the middle, we don't know. MISO is trying to figure out what to do with energy storage. California is, like, we love energy storage bumper stickers. So you've got all these different rules in all these different places uh, and trying to figure out, what, what can I do? What, what's possible? What am I going to get paid for? What I've also seen uh, over time is there's this hierarchy to how we're going to deal with stress on the grid, be that peaks, be that... Um, reliability, and so the first thing is you hit the lowest hanging fruit, which is always going to be energy efficiency. 
Um, you're always going to see rebates for getting rid of your old freezer that is an energy um, monster and getting money then to buy a new energy efficient appliance. Uh, you're going to see uh, lots of, of buildings are going into this energy efficiency mantra, steps being one of them, uh, to make sure we're utilizing our space and our AC and our heat and so forth. So, but efficiency is that low hanging fruit. There's only so much you can get from energy efficiency. So the next one seems to be demand response, which is let me, as let's say the TO or the grid, call you when I need you to reduce load for whatever reason. Um, and there's a huge market for demand response, it's been around for a very long time. It used to be very clunky, it used to be quite miserable, um, but we've gotten a lot better at it over time. The next hanging fruit is what are called flexi watts, which would be something like a hot water heater. Uh, where you've got this thermal reservoir that you can call upon to either heat or discharge. Then we look at transmission lines, uh, be it the addition of transmission lines, shoring up of transmission lines. Then folks will look at flexible generation, so adding uh, be it behind the meter or at a particular site generation to help reduce stress. And then energy storage will be considered. It is still not on the forefront of people's minds as an option. And part of that goes back to everything you see about it. So I gave a similar lecture in January, February, and in six months we've seen a ton of things change uh, over that time period. Um, FERC, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, has decided it is going to look at how all of the markets deal with energy storage and whether or not there are barriers in place uh, for energy storage entry into those marketplaces. Uh, FERC is also going to look at how it assesses some various portions of the market and how it makes some of its decisions. We've seen a number of companies throw out the traditional utility model. Um, we've seen companies like MGM being one of the most recent, Google as well, say, I don't want to be tied to this utility anymore. I want to be able to say, I'm getting my energy from here. I want it to be a certain type, be that renewable or gas fired, no coal, whatever it happens to be. And they're saying, I'm going to go independent. I don't need this utility anymore. And that is a huge, huge change from in the past. Um, I don't know that anybody ever thought to jump ship from a TO provider. Uh, we're also seeing kind of along the same lines, um, with energy storage falling on the coattails of solar, uh, Folks are now contemplating, well, what is the true value of solar then? So folks said, okay, we're going we're to put in a PV installation so that we can re reduce peak load. Fantastic. At the same time, put a little bit of stress on the system because we know that PV is variable. But solar can also offer some of those other societal benefits we talked about. Reduction of greenhouse gases, um, reducing pollution in the area, and so forth. So we're getting this value of solar developing, which will obviously then translate over to a value of energy storage as well. So all of this is really coming out of California and Hawaii. Hawaii has hit its net meter and cap. So if you install any more PV in Hawaii, that's great. You're not selling it to the grid. Whatever extra you're not using, you're not selling it. Uh, California has um, the what's been called the duck curve. Um, which is the issue of solar is obviously available uh, during your daytime hours, but once that sun sets, you have a huge ramp uh, as everyone switches then to going to grid power, and that ramp uh, can put complete ridiculous stress on the grid. <coughs> and so when we talk about the value of storage, well, what is the value of storage in making sure that that system doesn't go into a cascading failure? Uh, we've also seen um, one of the more different takes on this. Um, there are a number of states in New England that have renewable portfolio standards, um, and encompassed in that is, uh, in essence, where are they going to get their energy from by a certain time period. So we want to make sure X percentage of our energy is coming from renewable sources by this particular date. Just so happens in ISO New England, where these states are located, uh, last year was the first increase they've seen in uh, carbon dioxide uh, in, in, what is it, since 2010. That's a problem because that breaks the reno renewable portfolio standard. That immediately puts them in non-compliance. Uh, so you can imagine one of the things that folks are going to look into is why did this happen and what can we do to mitigate this so it doesn't happen again. 
obviously I'm thinking about energy storage. One of the big topics of discussion was what to do with spent uh, EV batteries. Um, your EV battery still has about 80% of its charge life um, once you cannot use it for your car. Uh, so that makes it actually a suitable uh, entity to use for peak shading, frequency regulation, whatever it happens to be. So we didn't see utilities jumping on this. We didn't see necessarily um, companies like what I work for um, in terms of energy resource management jumping on this. So BMW and Nissan took it upon themselves to start gathering all those spent batteries and using them as energy storage devices. Fantastic. And then of course, California, the hotbed of energy storage. Um, with the canyon leak of natural gas, we're seeing a stressed system. So the California PUC pushed through legislation to allow utilities to procure quickly uh, energy storage technologies. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of megawatts in this case. Uh, we also have a change to their self-generation uh, program in that energy storage not only can take, take place in that program, but they've also kind of put in what percentages need to be energy storage, what can be natural gas, and so forth. And one of the big, thing that's come, big things that's coming is utilities would really like to own in California behind the meter energy storage at their customer sites because then they can control it and if they own it they can put it in the rate base. That's big deal. That's a very big deal because that could push out companies like where I work um, that do behind the meter storage or behind the meter asset uh, development. It could put an unfair price to the energy storage asset. Um, a lot of folks have a lot of bitterness towards utilities, uh, particularly ones that were vertically integrated and owned their generation, and folks felt like that wasn't a very good idea. Other folks felt that that was a good idea. We could argue that if you wish. Uh, but this will ripple effect. Uh, whatever California and Texas are doing, you can bet it's gonna trickle to the east. So the trends to watch, if you were going to invest in energy storage technologies, what is it that you want to consider? One, those non-wires alternatives. There are a number of grants, requests for proposals, mandates, and so on that are supporting uh, non-wires alternatives, meaning please don't build transmission, try to find another way to deal with this situation. Energy storage fits right in. Ancillary markets, particularly in PJM, energy storage had its coming of age in terms of frequency response. Uh, unfortunately, now that market is most likely saturated, so folks are going to be looking for not only those markets in other ISO and RTOs, but also what else can storage do. The pairing of solar and storage, of course, it makes perfect sense. Uh, we need an asset that can firm, firm the renewables. We would like an asset that has other functions put in energy storage. Microgrids, particularly in New York and New Jersey, there are a number of incentives. There's the New York Prize program, there's New Jersey State recovery program, something along those lines that came in after um, all the hurricanes hit, that are saying, we want you to build microgrids. We want you to have a percentage of renewables, a percentage of fossil, a percentage of storage in these microgrids. We also know that resiliency is something that everybody wants, but nobody knows how to monetize it. So as folks get better at that, I'm thinking one of our think tanks, like the National Renewable Energy Labs, Oak Ridge or Sandia, or Pacific Northwest will come up with some metric that we all can use eventually. And also research and development. Like I said, there is a huge amount of chemistry going on in terms of making batteries particularly more efficient, uh, less volatile, uh, longer lasting. And as those chemistries improve, we're going to see the cost structures come down and it'll be even harder to decide which storage asset you'd like to deploy. So we can see a number of things as challenges or opportunities, depends on how you look at it. We know storage is here to stay. It's not going away. We know that it's most likely going to increase, be that at the utility scale or behind the vehicle, both. We know that there are some issues uh, that are coming up in regulatory uh, in terms of what is storage, how is it classified, how can I use it, how can I make money from it. We have there's a number of utilities that are stressed, be that by net metering, be that by um, renewables that are being added to the system on a large scale, and that's going to cause some changes. We know that when you're trying to choose an energy storage system, it can be a hot mess, and, and that is the technical term, because there's just so many attributes you need to look at, so many revenue streams that might be available, uh, topography, safety issues, components, 
uh, it can be a completely daunting task, and folks are going to be needed to sort through all that. We also know that storage costs are going to come down, but there are still a number of other system costs that might still stay at their steady state. Um, we want to make sure that we're following that, and hopefully we'll see those costs decrease. Storage is under constant competition from all those other low-hanging fruits, uh, your efficiency, demand response, flexi watts, and so on. And what we do know is there is a cloud of convergence that's coming between the microgrids, the incentives, federal regulations, net metering caps, renewables, and so forth. They're all pushing energy storage into the front of the market. And so those are all the trends that I would keep in mind. And think about these as opportunities, um, even though they are challenging.